plenary panel discussion on uh, public law and democracy. We're going to have a wonderful two-part discussion. First, we are hearing from Professor Cass Sunstein, who is the Robert Wormsley Professor of Law uh, at the Harvard Law School and holds many other uh, appointments. He's currently a regulatory officer at the Department of Homeland Security in the United States government, but he's speaking today in his personal capacity and of course his views in no way reflect the views of the United States government. He's also an advisor to the WHO and a founder of essentially modern behavioral economics and it's relevant to law. He founded uh, and is director of the program on behavioral economics and public policy at Harvard. That work has traveled all around the world and is deeply influential in the United Kingdom and elsewhere. He currently advises the World Health Organization and the global impact of his work has been recognized in so many ways, but including notably in the Norwegian Holberg Prize, which many people regard uh, as the equivalent of the Nobel Prize uh, in law and humanities. But uh, many of you will know Professor Sunstein already because you will have read and cited his many impressive and important uh, books. Indeed, uh, for those who are aficionados of pop culture, you will know the game that is the popular parlor game, Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. But for law uh, aficionados, the equivalent of the Kevin Bacon game uh, is Six Degrees of Cass Sunstein, which is a, an article where people try and identify how many degrees uh, they are away from Professor Sunstein by virtue of whether they have co-authored with him or one, one of his co-authors. Uh, his fame has haunted me my whole career uh, because I took over from him teaching elements at the University of Chicago Law School in my first year as an assistant professor. And all I can say is that my students were deeply disappointed. So Professor Sunstein is not only uh, a famous parlor game, uh, a distinguished university professor, but he has also been my longstanding teaching nemesis. But he is nonetheless a, a, a valued colleague and an esteemed uh, contributor to the field of constitutional studies and comparative constitutional studies. And he is so uh, generous in joining us here at this Mundo conference to give our uh, keynote address focusing on his one of many recent and deeply important books, uh, which pertains most relevantly to democracy, which is Liars, Falsehoods and Free Speech in an Age of Deception. No doubt he'll also tell us about his interesting new book on noise uh, as part of that. But first and foremost, we're here to think about democracy and public law, threats to it, the future of it, and what we can do to buttress and support it. And so it's my absolute great pleasure to thank and welcome Professor Sunstein to talk about liars and falsehoods. Thank you so much, Cass. Uh, thank you so much. It's a great honor to be able to address this uh, very distinguished group and to uh, speak on this very distinguished panel. And Roz, uh, by reports, your teaching was extraordinary. And those of us who were your predecessors are a little like athletes who were surpassed by the subsequent superstars. So thank you for that on behalf of students and the University of Chicago. Uh, the question of lies and falsehoods has become somewhat improbably uh, central to thinking about democracy and law in the modern era. Uh, there's an argument that it is the central issue, and I'm going to have a few things to say about how to rethink it. Uh, I have some epigraphs uh, with which to begin. The first is from uh, Michael Robottom, the great mystery writer who said this in his terrific novel, Good Girl, Bad Girl. Some lies are selfish, some inflate or conflate or mitigate or simply omit. Some are told for good reason. People lie because they think it doesn't matter. They lie because telling the truth would mean giving up control or because the truth is inconvenient or because they don't want to disappoint or because they desperately want it to be true. I've heard them all, I've told them all. The second is from Hannah Arendt. Seen from the viewpoint of politics, truth has a despotic character. It is therefore hated by tyrants who rightly fear the competition of a coercive force they cannot monopolize. And it enjoys a rather precarious status in the eyes of governments. 
The third is from Shakespeare, and these are from the uh, the last four lines of his trickiest poem. And while it's about love, it's also about democracy, I think, at least at a certain level of generality. And notice the punning, if you would, which are very, very clever. Oh, love's best habit is in seeming trust. An age in love loves not to have years told, Therefore, I lie with her, and she with me, and in our faults by lies we flattered be. Okay, I'm going to have uh, three empirical findings. That's going to be part one. Then I'm going to talk about the renewal of liberalism and John Stuart Mill. And then I'm going to say something about rethinking as well as renewing liberalism with particular reference to William Blake. Okay, there are three empirical findings uh, which are part one and they're gonna come pretty quickly. The first is that, well, let's, let's illustrate it rather than uh, describe it. I don't know if you all heard that the great golfer Tiger Woods retired yesterday. I don't know if you heard that breaking news. Um, it's an important event in the annals of sport. Okay, I just lied. Tiger Woods did not um, retire yesterday. Um, but you will, and I apologize for this, for weeks to come and potentially months and years to come, have a little voice in your head thinking, Tiger Woods retired. That was major, even though I told you in real time that that was a lie. It's called truth bias, and the empirical finding is when someone says something that's false, a political leader, uh, someone involved in a political movement in some kind, even if there's an immediate correction of the falsehood, the human mind recalls it as in some sense potentially true, and that is a persistent um, uh, fact. That is very disturbing from the standpoint of theories of the marketplace of ideas. It's not just that truth can't catch up with a lie, it's that lies lodge in the human brain. The second finding is that falsehoods spread more quickly than truths. This is a documented fact on social media and elsewhere. They spread more rapidly and they spread more than truths. The mechanism behind this finding isn't entirely clear. We don't know exactly why. Some hints from other empirical work suggest that the reason falsehoods spread more quickly than truth is that they are surprising and what's surprising tends to spread. And second, that they trigger relevant emotions like anger and fear more than truth does. And things that trigger relevant emotions tend to spread more quickly. The third finding is the most familiar of the three, which is that like-minded people engaged in discussion with one another tend to end up more confident, more unified, and more extreme. So if there's a group of people who tend to believe something that's false and they are talking with each other, at the end of the conversation, unity, confidence, and extremism in the form of commitment to that belief will intensify. If we put together truth bias with the relatively rapid spread of falsehood and group polarization, we have a very challenging brew uh, for democratic processes. Okay, that's the end of part one. Part true is to suggest, and this I will confess was a part of the book and this project that I didn't want to write that is, I sought this project and these remarks to be a kind of manifesto about the danger of falsehood and the need to get a handle on it. As the project uh, has continued to this day, uh, against my wishes, uh, John Stuart Mill has kind of taken over uh, the first part of the song, and now you're going to hear, hear uh, the second part of the remarks, the first part of the song, which might be called against the truth police. And the suggestion is that liberalism needs to be renewed, maybe more now than in a long time. 
in its commitment to robust protection of speech, including falsehoods and even lies. Now that's the first part of the song. I, I uh, warn you or promise you there's going to be a second part, but let's uh, not sing, but tell this first part of the song. Okay, there, there's five reasons why ample protection of falsehoods, including lies, is a really good idea in democracies and even if they can bear it, non-democracies. The first is that because of problems of bias and problems of imperfect competence, let's say, any arbiter of what's truth or false is imperfectly trustworthy. For public officials, the risk of self-serving bias is self-evidently severe. For public servants, it's also the case that their capacity to separate truth from falsehood, even if it's not self-interested, is uh, less than perfect. So the question of trust of officials being arbiters of truth should be put in a bold letters and extremely large thought. That was Mill's maybe principal argument for protection of free speech, including falsehoods. The second is if one chills falsehoods, which is a very good thing, one will simultaneously chill truth, which is a bad thing. In the greatest tribute to democracy in American constitutional law, Robert Jackson wrote, compulsory unification of opinion achieves un only the unanimity of the graveyard. And the unanimity of the graveyard is the kind of extreme case of, of freezing people as they start to utter things. Thinking, for example, if libelous words are freely subject to criminal punishment or to severe damage, they ought to steer clear of the line because even a civil suit or a criminal prosecution is a horror, even in circumstances in which you will ultimately be vindicated. So breathing space for truth is necessary and to give that some protection of falsehoods is also necessary. The third point, which is Mill's kind of, I think uh, now we're gonna get to Mill's more heartfelt liberal arguments for protection of falsehood in self-governing societies, not his most fundamental, but the ones that seem to resonate with his spirit best. First, if you have um, protection for things that aren't true, you make things that are true living and vibrant truths rather than dead and dusty dogmas. So for people who believe things that are true, to have challenges to those truths, even if they're extremely painful and without merit, are really important as a way of making people uh, live with science or data rather than uh, sleep with science or data. The vibrancy of a democratic society depends on challenges, even meritless challenges, to what is widely believed. And those meritless challenges can include challenges that are ill-motivated or uh, self-interested. It's also the case, and this is, I think, implicit in Mill, that outlawing or sanctioning falsehood and lies gives a kind of glamour to them. It creates a kind of magnetic force around them. It makes those who deploy them not fools or wrongdoers, but martyrs and heroes. And that's a pragmatic reason to be extremely cautious about regulating in any way falsehoods and lies in democracies because of the uh, counterproductive effect it has on, let's say, the good motives of those who are seeking censorship. The fifth point is not in Mill, and that is that it's extremely important in any society to know what our fellow citizens think. That's a big epistemic gain. And if it's the case that a number of our fellow citizens think that climate change isn't real, that the ozone layer isn't under threat, that COVID-19 is uh, a conspiracy and not a disease, then to know that fact is important. There will be uh, 
an amping up of pluralistic ignorance, which is a very dangerous thing in democracies, if either norms or law in particular, my focus, make it impossible or unlawful for people to utter or to act on even what they actually think. So now we have a quintet of reasons, a problem of distrust, chilling of truth, living truths rather than dead dogmas, learning what others think and glamorizing a falsehood that make a powerful case for broad protection of uh, speech, even if it is untrue and even if it is intentionally untrue, it is, it is known to be untrue. Okay, now the song that I wanted these remarks to be all about, but couldn't get there. Still, this second part of the song is uh, severely qualifying what you've just heard. And my hero here is William Blake, who wrote in marginalia to Sir Joshua Reynolds' great lectures on art, where Reynolds was making a plea for generalization and generality in art. Blake wrote with some exasperation and I think wit and fire. Blake wrote, um, to generalize is to be an idiot. To particularize is the alone distinction of true merit. I thank God I am not like Reynolds. And what you've just heard from uh, Neo Millian, yours truly, is like Reynolds. And now I'm going to try to be like Blake. If we think of cases that are familiar in democratic societies, perjury, selling products on the ground that they cure cancer, lying to the authorities about the wrongdoing of innocent others, falsely crying fire in a crowded theater, libeling people by saying they're engaged in misconduct of terrible kinds, all of those in one or another form are unlawful in free societies. And they make the million arguments, however heartfelt they are, look somewhat high-minded and tinny. In the face of perjury, selling a product on the ground that it cures cancer when it doesn't, or libeling people, the idea that it's really important to hear what our fellow citizens think, or that it's very important to avoid glamorizing uh, falsehood, starts to look like a, what is it, like a bumper sticker rather than an argument. We could proliferate examples in which the freest of free societies, sometimes to protect democracy, sometimes for, to protect health and safety, are interested in some form of legal restriction on speech. In proliferating the examples would require us to work inductively from them to build a framework to separate the first song that is the million song from the more uh, skeptical proliferation of counterexamples where high mindedness is a fair accusation. So what we need to do is to develop a framework that distinguishes the cases in which the liberal arguments work from the cases in which they won't. And here is an effort to generate a framework. And the idea is to discipline, let's say considered intuitions of multiple kinds by uh, figuring out where one is forceful and where one is weak. Okay, the framework suggests we need to look at four factors, the state of mind of the speaker, the gravity of the harm, the timing of the harm, and the likelihood of the harm. And we could have a continuum with respect to each of the four factors, but instead of doing that, let's have points where four is the most extreme, let's say, and one is the most uh, uh, innocent or small. And uh, to give those inarticulate words some content, let's talk about each of the four. So with respect to the state of mind, we can imagine a case in which a speaker is intentionally lying, a case in which a speaker is reckless, a case in which a speaker is negligent, and a case in which a speaker is completely innocent. If a speaker says, for example, that the polls are closing at early in the afternoon in an intentional effort to discourage voting, that is a different case from one in which someone innocently but mistakenly says 
that climate change isn't real. The theories of free speech that Mill inaugurated ought to make the state of the mind, state of mind of the speaker central because deterring an intentional falsehood maker is not a grave thing. Deterring a negligent falsehood maker or an innocent one is indeed a grave thing. If we're worried about chilling truth, we don't have to worry so much if the person is well aware that she or he is lying. With respect to gravity of harm, we could imagine cases in which the harm is catastrophic, in which the case, case in which the car harm is severe, a case in which the, the harm is moderate, and a case in which the harm is essentially zero. If someone says John F. Kennedy was actually never president of the United States, and it's a puzzle that everyone thinks he is, was, that is a harmless falsehood. If someone says that Labrador retrievers, one of them is sleeping right next to me here, are not the best dog, hello, my dog, that is a falsehood, but that is a, I believe, sorry, German Shepherd lovers or Australian sheepdog lovers, but that is not a harmful falsehood. If someone says something about, let's say, voting that will um, make it so that the democratic process is severely undermined because people won't vote, that is a grave harm. If someone says a falsehood with respect to a disease, that will predictably increase significantly the number of people who die, that is a grave harm. With respect to timing of harm, we also have four points and the extreme one is the harm's gonna happen imminently and the other extreme is it's gonna happen in the distant future. We could imagine a case where it's gonna happen soon within the next, let's say six months and a case in which it's going to happen relatively soon, let's say predictably within the next year. The timing of the harm quite matters because if there is imminent harm, and this is Oliver Wendell Holmes's case, the argument for an immediate restriction or protection is really forceful. If the harm isn't imminent but long term, then counter speech, as Justice Brandeis suggested, is the right remedy. And the fourth factor is the likelihood of harm, where the extreme points are 100% likely and one over a very large number unlikely, and we can imagine cases in between. As the likelihood of harm approaches 100%, the argument for some kind of restriction gets really larger. Okay, this is a very simple kind of toy framework. We could do it to produce a very large number of boxes with check marks for freedom and check marks for regulation and question marks where we're not sure how to handle them. My suggestion is that we can think on the basis of this toy framework of what makes cases easy. Cases in which we have, let's say, a four on the scale with respect to all four. An intentional harm that will produce grave harm with 100% probability today. We can think of cases that are easy the other way where we have, let's say, an innocent speaker producing a very small harm in the distant future with low probability. When cases are hard, it might be because the state of the mind of the speaker is a four, the gravity of the harm is a three, the timing of the harm is a two, and the likelihood of the harm is a three. There is some pressure we can put on the framework in various ways, but my suggestion is that helps uh, figure out when we want to generalize and when we don't want to be an idiot. One substantive point before I conclude, which is that the rise of social media, apart from all the terrible things it's done, from the standpoint of democratic self-government has done one extremely good thing in, the, in terms of broadening the, the, the number of tools that are available with which to control threats to democracy that come from falsehoods and lies. What we have now is what we've never had in human history, which is architectural and educative tools that fall short of censorship or damage awards that can potentially do somewhere between a lot of good and some good. 
Architectural tools involve downgrading falsehoods and lies, producing less circulation of falsehoods and lies, doing things so as to minimize the likelihood that people will see falsehoods and lies without taking them down. Facebook and Twitter have used architectural strategies and they are highly responsive to the empirical findings with which I started, including truth bias. There are also educative possibilities, including warnings, referrals to truth, top of the page or the website uh, information sources of the sort that Facebook has, which can be somewhat helpful. And if you're lucky, a little better than that, encountering falsehoods and truths. The educative responses run into the problem of truth bias, which is an important limitation, but we don't want to overstate the importance of truth bias. Probably while some of you have a little voice in your head thinking, did Tiger Woods retire? I am hopeful all of you know Tiger Woods did not retire. Okay, I've been focusing mostly on governments but the implications fall to private institutions, including social media providers, television networks, magazines, and newspapers as well. They should be acting, and here's the blank part of the remarks rather than the mill part, more aggressively than they now do to control falsehoods and lies. They should do, be doing more than they now are to prevent the spread of misinformation involving health and safety and doctored videos, including deep fakes. These are specific conclusions, but they bear on some of the biggest and least specific issues in all of politics and law, and indeed in daily life itself. Hannah Arendt, my spirit guide here, put it this way, what is at stake here is this common and factual reality itself and this is indeed a political problem of the first order. The principle of freedom of speech, I suggest, should not be taken to forbid reasonable efforts to protect reality. Thanks. Well, that was magnificent, Cass. Thank you so much. I think we now have to call you a Ren Blakeian uh, for someone who can combine these really helpful general uh, neo Millian principles with a particularist eye to how we might come up with a, uh, a four by four. I, I wouldn't call it a toy uh, set of guidance for thinking about context and, and those four guiding uh, principles. It's a terrific opening. We have time for perhaps just one or two questions before uh, we, we let Cass go to what is going to be a busy day of meetings for him and turn it over to our plenary panel for a broader discussion. We have a question, uh, Cass, from Stefano about whether you think that social media is essentially uh, profiting from the fact of your second kind of empirical generalization about the spread of lies over truth or do advertisers impose some check? If someone wants to post a second question for Professor Sunstein while he answers the first, uh, we'll invite that before we move on to the plenary. Cass. There's no thank you for that. There's no question that social media platforms are profiting from the uh, spreading of lies. It's a, it's a terrible, in this case, I spent many years at the University of Chicago. I love the profit motive. In this case, the profit motive has a, a terrible consequence. And some of the people at Twitter and Facebook and elsewhere have been doing excellent work at trying to uh, respond to the problem. Uh, sometimes it looks like at the expense of profits uh, because the profits are so great, it would be very good to see more of those efforts. And then we have a second question, which I think is in the, the Blakeian spirit of distinguishing between particular lies damaging businesses or individuals and lies that affect public policy. Is that a, a friendly amendment to your gravity scale or something else? Yeah, it's good. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to say that, uh, that the democratic threat ranks higher necessarily than the threat to individuals though if we had to choose, we would say yes, because the magnitude question is crucial. Um, 
Okay, so uh, there are many people whose lives have been severely impaired or destroyed by lies circulated about them. And in some countries, the law forbids some sort of help. And in other countries, the law makes it very challenging for get them to get some kind of help. And in the United States, Justice Gorsuch and Justice Thomas, I think are quite right in raising serious cautionary notes about the easy celebration of breathing space for libel. What the right outcome of those cautionary notes are is, is an extremely fair and urgent question. But for damaged individuals, uh, uh, all nations, I think, need to be thinking really hard. And Justice Thomas rightly says that if the individual is a participant in democratic process, say, let's suppose trying to run for office, and someone destroys that person's reputation, the harm done is more serious in some, on, along some dimensions, not less serious. Well, the, the questions are now tumbling in, uh, in a typical uh, cascade of the kind that cast uh, studies, but we need to pause uh, and just thank him for a terrific uh, keynote. And these are questions that we are going to continue uh, in the next part of our discussion. So a virtual and very heartfelt thanks, Cass, for, for your very interesting and helpful uh, remarks, which are going to guide our, our thinking, I think, about these topics in both a platform and a governmental uh, setting for many years to come and provoke great discussion in the next hour. So thank you. Thank you so, so much. Now, I look forward to getting a download uh, to hearing more later. Thank you. So now the second lie of the evening, which is Ash Barty will and has won Wimbledon, even though it hasn't occurred. Uh, so our second uh, part of this plenary uh, discussion about public law and democracy features four extremely distinguished uh, and very diversely uh, experienced and knowledgeable scholars. We have Professors Asla Bali from the UCLA School of Law and Professor David Law from Hong Kong uh, University, as well as Dr. Karen Stenner and Senior Advocate in, um, Dira Jai Singh. I'm going to say a little bit about their backgrounds before I take uh, them into the discussion about truth and lies, the state of democracy, where and why we got here and what can be done about it, all in a, a 45 minute tour before we take it back to our audience and their questions. So Professor Bali is um, not only Professor of Law at UCLA School of Law, she's also the Faculty Director of the Promise Institute of Human Rights. She is an expert in international law, but also comparative constitutional law with a particular expertise and focus on the Middle East. She's published extremely widely and is co-chair of the Advisory Council for the Middle East and North Africa Division of Human Rights Watch. <clears throat> Professor David Law is the Sir Y. K. Power Chair in Public Law at the University of Hong Kong, Faculty of Law there, though he will be joining uh, the University of Virginia Faculty of Law this fall as the E. James Kelly Junior Class of 1965 Research Professor of Law. David can uh, be read in more languages than any of us can speak uh, and has studied in almost as many places and continents. And he's an expert that we'll be drawing on this evening, this morning on uh, Asia and particularly East Asia, although he will be known to some of you for his ability to scrape uh, meaning out of words and do very interesting interdisciplinary uh, work which uses large N methods. <clears throat> Senior advocate Indira Jai Singh will be known to many of you for her trailblazing work at the Lawyers Collective in India, for the fact that she was then the first woman appointed as a senior advocate by the Bombay High Court, that she was an additional solicitor general and has done some of the most important public law cases in the last decade and more in India as an advocate and been recognised for that contribution in a, in a whole variety of ways, including in a Fortune magazine list as the 40 greatest leaders of the world, but no doubt she would point to many other honours as far more important uh, for recognising the impact of her work in South Asia itself. And last but certainly not least, Dr Karen Stenner, who is a political psychologist and founder of Insights Analytics, which is a behavioural insights firm that uses the tools of behavioural science to support democracy and tolerance, good governance and sustainability. 
Karen, like me, is based in Australia, but she used to be a professor at Princeton and Duke and is most uh, known for her very prescient and important work in 2005, The Authoritarian Dynamic, where she effectively predicted the psychological and social cultural dynamics that would give rise to President Trump and the new form of authoritarian politics that we are all debating at this conference have been writing about for some years and which she warns us we may be needing to think about for some years to come. So I'm extremely grateful to all four of them for joining us for this discussion and to have such a breadth of interdisciplinary as well as global geographic knowledge and expertise. So my first question, Karen, is to you. You've heard uh, Cass talk about the psychological uh, dynamics of uh, if you like, fake news, lies. Do you agree with his um, diagnosis of the problem of what drives this as a phenomenon that is posing such a, a real risk to our reality and to our democracy? You're muted, Karen. Karen, you're muted. Sorry, I thought you were in charge of that. <laughs> Um, I can obviously speak most knowledgeably to that issue um, from the point of view of those with authoritarian predispositions. Um, I just want to, for those who don't have much sort of understanding of where I'm coming from, which is quite distinct from some of your other perspectives, I'm not talking about authoritarianism as a characteristic of leaders or as the character of a regime, but rather as a, a feature of the psychology of the masses. And so right across liberal democracy, around about a third of populations have what you might think of as a very low level authoritarian predisposition. And just to summarize, a really strong need for oneness and sameness is the quickest way that I can describe that. And that makes it very, you know, and so instead of thinking of everyone in a democracy, all of us sort of evolving in this sort of linear fashion towards you know, being more perfect democratic citizens, there's a very large chunk of populations in democracies and non-democracies that like alike that will never find it comfortable to live in a democracy. And in fact, the core features of democracy, you know, the cacophony of diverse opinions and leaders being critiqued and overturned and, you know, battles for power and different understandings of the good life and, you know, issue conflict and, and moral dilemmas and all of those things sort of constantly playing out is just anathema to authoritarians. It's just like their worst nightmare. And I think the function, you know, just sort of just to go directly to your question, the function that fake news serves for them is just to simplify that world, right? In the in the most basic sense, um, you know, if you think of Trump, the very obvious example is if it's bad for him, negative for him, it's fake news. It's really, really simple. And that enables them in this really, really complex world to maintain a consistent picture of what that world is and to soothe themselves and to calm themselves because everything ends up fitting in because it's all lining up affectively under, if you like Trump, then these things are true and these things are false, these things are good and these things are bad and it just makes life easier. And so sort of cycling back a little bit to what I was saying about people having authoritarian predispositions, it's substantially heritable. It's about 50% heritable according to studies of identical twins read together and apart. And the two, there's really two major factors that, that cause someone to have an authoritarian predisposition. One is lack of a personality dimension called openness to experience. You know, people who like complexity and diversity and new and interesting experiences and people and like thrive on, on difference. Um, and the second factor for one of a more polite way to describe it is cognitive limitations. And so if you think of those two things together, they limit, uh, so cognitive, um, so openness to experience and cognitive limitations limit people's willingness and capacity respectively to deal with diversity and complexity. And so I come back to that very low level sort of where did this come from question, um, just to sort of help you understand why it's so critical to those people to have you know, you, they think of the world as there's one true people, there's one right way, way to be, we need this one leader, and then everything that's good for him is good for us, and everything he says is true, and everything else is fake. And so that's a real uh, sort of powerful simplification mechanism for them that actually enables them to live in a democracy. And I guess a lot of my research for a, probably the last decade now has been about more um, ways to help them live in democracy uh, in ways that are more beneficial for the rest of us. And so I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to talk about that as we go along. So what, what could we do better to help them live in peace with liberal democracy so they don't need to resort to 
don't need to be pushed out to extremes and underground and to be attracted to, as what as Cass described, the martyrs and the heroes and the people on the extremes. Um, if you don't allow people to sort of say these things out loud and process them in normal political processes, that's where they end up. And so just so that um, people who are not familiar with the, the broad argument have some understanding it. So a third of us have an authoritarian predisposition. What about the other two thirds? Who are they? And are they susceptible to these lies too? Uh, so I think that they are, but I don't think that they need them to the same extent. And so I think all the same things you understand about people having the capacity to complex, process complex information and to deal with the complexity and diversity of modern liberal democracy, that would apply to people who weren't uh, of authoritarian disposition um, as well. It's just that authoritarians really, really need simplicity. They need oneness, sameness, simplicity. They need to cut complexity. They find it extremely difficult to deal with diversity. So they're the people who need it the most. And just to sort of be really clear, and this is a very complex issue, but I make it really, really, you know, 10 seconds, it's distinct from conservatism and authoritarianism basically is an aversion to complexity. Um, conservatism is an aversion to change. So that's difference over space as opposed to difference over time. And so sometimes their needs and interests coincide and they can be sort of moderate allies. They're actually fairly weakly related. Uh, but there's really critical moments in the life of a, a modern liberal democracy when those people will uh, diverge. So if you have a stable modern liberal democracy with well-established institutions that are consensually supported, uh, leaders and institutions that are trusted, uh, that are protecting minority rights and liberty, et cetera, that's, that's the status quo. And a true conservative should be very dedicated to preserving that. An authoritarian, on the other hand, will uh, happily overthrow those institutions and leaders and um, uh, go for massive social change, you know, that's being promised just down the end of the, the, you know, shining path, if at the other end, they think that there'll be greater oneness and sameness. So that's a very, very different mindset uh, to conservatives. So if I'm telling you about a third of most populations are authoritarian, the right wing to left wing breakdown of that is about 19 points to you know, about 14. So it's about a third and it's about 19 to 14. So left-wing authoritarians are almost as common as right-wing authoritarians. And you can get your head around that if you stop thinking of conservatism and authoritarianism as the same thing. And of all the things that I study, that's the thing I have the most arguments and fights with people about, but it's the one that I think is the most important for people to understand if we're gonna have sensible solutions going forward. And I can't even remember what you asked me, Roz, but somehow I that's felt- perfect. That that You've given us our perfect. typology and the sensibility of the non-authoritarian types. So David, Indira, Asla, what's the state of truth in the world today, how much are uh, fake news and lies a problem in politics and, and in democracy uh, in the regions you think about and study? And, and then we're going to zoom out and talk about the state of democracy more generally. David, start us off. Yeah, sure. I think in um, in Asia, East Asia particularly, I'm, I'm more concerned. I think we should be more concerned about state responses to the specter of fake news and misinformation than to fake news misinformation themselves. And you know, on speech and press, I'm very shaped by my experience of living here for the last five years, but I'm gonna be an unreconstructed old school liberal on this stuff, you know? Um, so, you know, threats to, to freedom and, and uh, to press and free speech are not just a problem for democracies, uh, but also for democratization. It's hard to see how democratic processes can kick off if people can't even express political ideas, which is precisely why you see, for example, the Chinese regime in Beijing actively suppressing political expression in Hong Kong, right? The way to uh, strangle democratization in its cradle is to go after political expression. So two things I want to say about this idea of fake news, and I'll, for a bonus, I'll throw in doxing, right? I'm going to throw in doxing with the fake news, and I'm going to throw in Southeast Asia with East Asia. I'm going to give you two for the price of one, right? So first, you know, fake news is not, I don't think of it as a new problem. And I think as a result, we should not, we should try not to overreact. Uh, it is an old problem that one in way for a while, in large part because of technology, and it is now coming back in large part because of technology. And two, we should not overreact to uh, you know the fake news specter or people being doxxed because this is a classic case of the cure being worse than the disease from a constitutional design perspective. As, as you know, with your, your new book with uh, David Landau, Abuse of Constitutional Borrowing, some solutions are extremely prone to abuse and regimes are just itching to take advantage of them, right? I, you know, I call this Madison's law, right? Always assume the worst. If men were angels, blah, 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 but they're not angels, 
right? Whatever the worst use is that can be made of a legal doctrine or a statute or a solution, that's exactly what will happen. The people you least want to seize on it will be people who seize on it, right? So let's think about fake news for a second, right? So, um, you know, not so long ago, certainly within our lifetimes, people bemoaned the mainstream media for not offering diversity of viewpoints, mostly watered down left of center pablum, particularly in America, suitable for corporate America and its centrist, uh, centrist two-party system, only the illusion of choice in the marketplace of ideas and the political arena. Now we're complaining that the media are too extreme, factually unreliable, we have splintering fragmentation, all these networks that are running around unaccountable, and we're bemoaning anti-democratic populist, even fascist tendencies in a mainstream political party. But the kind of gatekeeping that would be needed to deal with this problem uh, is also called censorship, right? So, you know, this idea of a moderate, careful, responsible, corporate mainstream friendly press is itself a relatively new thing in historical terms. Its emergence reflected in part the emergence of economies of scale uh, in media production over the 19th and 20th centuries, and is now being undone by the disintermediation of social media where every Yahoo with access to Yahoo can basically become a content creator. So we no longer have effective gatekeeping by media organizations that have very large fixed investments of capital in presses or TV stations or whatever that they need to recoup by providing anodyne content to a wide audience. This is just not the case anymore. What we have now feels more like colonial America, right? Highly partisan press factually unreliable, inflammatory, and we have the equivalent of the Adams administration fretting over the late 18th century version of fake news, and now we're talking about adopting the equivalent of the Alien and Sedition Acts in response, right? This is old wine and new bottles. This is not a new problem. This is the internet age coming with some new buzzwords for a very old problem. And you can be sure, again, you know, any solution that government might come up with for regulating these problems, look, for instance, the Hong Kong anti-fake news statute you know it's gonna be applied only against regime critics. You know the doxing laws are crafted only to protect police, but not school teachers, right? Um, you know, so uh, the, the anti-doxing laws, there's another example, the Hong Kong, uh, they're talking about how a picture of a police officer's face, uh, if it's unflattering, right, uh, could be, could run afoul of the anti-doxing laws. The face is identifying information. So maybe you're not allowed to publish the police officer's face at all, right? Um, we have the anti-doxing law now, the reaction from Google, Facebook, and Twitter are in the news for saying that they will pull out of Hong Kong entirely if the anti-doxing laws are not pulled back. So again, you know, and, and you might think this is clear, right? Privacy laws are kind of these, they're first generation rights, but also third generation. Post-liberal democratic societies are really concerned about privacy. That's a big deal. But the problem is that the solution to protecting people's privacy in the form of these anti-doxing laws is pure poison in a lot of Asia. And we do not want to hand authoritarian rulers what they need on a sulfur platter to make it easier to suppress expression. Sobering uh, words, which are Blake in, in a very different way. And of course, to, to David's example from Hong Kong, I would add the Malaysian example of the anti-fake news uh, laws there as in very much the same category. Uh, Indira, what about India? Do you worry about uh, the suppression of speech or the distortion of speech in the marketplace for ideas more, or is it too hard to choose because they're both a problem? Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I, I would like to pose the question a little differently uh, in the Indian context. And uh, I would like to suggest that uh, from my experience in India, I think democracy collapsed before the advent of fake news. And fake news was a tool that was used by st the state and its various outreach arms to further the collapse of democracy. In other words, uh, fake news served an, the ideological purpose of the state in India. And uh, the, the problem, of course, is that the state and its agencies control the narrative. They control the narrative of the, what's going on in the country. They control the narrative about our lives. And that's where they use fake news to control the narrative. And there's no way that civil society can compete with their army of trolls. 
Now, having said this, what is it then that they're trying to do? And what are the tools that were used to dismantle democracy? And to which I would like to add the dismantlement of secularism in India. So it was an ideological change uh, which occurred with the current government when they came to power in 2014. I think they came with a determination that we are going to say that the Indian state is now a Hindu state. And when we talk about fake news, what we are seeing in the media is a narrative that India is a Hindu state. It is simply not a Hindu state. We have a written constitution in India. We have a secular constitution in India. We have strong protection for minorities in our constitution, in our laws. So when you have the state uh, propounding this narrative through fake news, we in civil society are at a definite disadvantage. And in that sense, the I don't know where, when we make the scale of the gravity and the likelihood and the harm caused and the mental intent, I don't know where something like this would fit. It would fit right at the top of the scale. It would fit in the, in the, in the first category. And that is the intention, which I think is by far the most important because when this intention exists, the intention to dismantle democracy, the intention to dismantle a secular state, it is achieved by the state through its various agencies. As I said, I don't have any way <coughs> of indicating uh, that, that we in civil society have been able to deal with this narrative. At the level of personal harm, it has caused immense personal harm. Uh, particularly, uh, you might have noticed women journalists, for example, uh, you have, uh, you know, morphed videos of uh, women journalists who have been critical of the state being put out on Twitter, on Facebook, uh, showing them as prostitutes or showing them as prostituting themselves, all fake, all completely fake. Now, to expect people to spend the rest of their lives in a court of law defending themselves is simply unrealistic you know you just have to give up your uh, your 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 professional work and spend the rest of your life defending yourself uh, well it has happened to me as well you mentioned that I was the founder of lawyers collective every single law in India has been weaponized and uh, and then fake news is spread uh, uh, for example, uh, in, in my case, they use the law of uh, foreign contribution, the Foreign Contribution Act. We were getting funding from Ford Foundation, from Open Society. So there you get a narrative. Well, you know, these are all agents of international, um, you know, international agents. These are people who are who have no business to be telling us what to do in India and what not to do in India. So there is that whole anti-internationalism, anti-intellectualism, which is also spread through fake news. Uh, so- Dira, uh, can I ask you one quick question, follow up before I turn over to Asli? You say democracy in India died. So the next sort of question I wanna ask is, where is democracy at in the regions in which you're expert? Is it dead? Is it damaged? Is Can it ever come back and, you know, I want to pick up on Cass's kind of numerical scale. What, forget Freedom House, what's the Indira Jai seeing temperature or number on, you know, if 10 is the perfect democracy and zero is the worst authoritarian state, where is India? And, you know, when do you say that, that the kind of serious damage began and was complete? Right. I did not say that democracy in India is dead and it is not dead. Why is it not dead? Because we still have access to courts of law. OK. And although I will not say it's very difficult to rate it. That's why I think Cass's, uh, you know, the, the framework he set out is a little difficult for me to deal with because ratings uh, somehow don't make any sense in a context which is so large. As, as you're dealing with a whole country, a whole nation, a whole ideology. But I will say that the rule of law in India is seriously eroded. And I would not agree with the previous speaker when he said that, you know, we must expect the worst from the state. No, I, I refuse to accept the worst from the state. I see the worst as a form of abuse 
uh, and when, assume, when abuse assumes the form of a policy, I'm afraid it has to be resisted to the nail and cannot be seen as the normal. I will not accept abuse as the new normal. So I can only tell you that uh, many of us are resisting, but at great cost to ourselves. Well, we admire your bravery and along with other colleagues, including uh, Preda Mata, who's been a longstanding member and council member and who has had uh, real challenges in terms of his resistance uh, to aspects of Indian uh, state policy. As a what about uh, news, fake news, lies, truth, democracy, and the challenge to secularism, any or all of those things in the region that you uh, think about uh, and work on in the Middle East, particularly Turkey or anything else in the region that you want to focus on? Thanks so much, uh, Raz. I think I, I will just connect uh, to a number of the comments that have been made already, uh, which I strongly agree with uh, in many of our regions where uh, democratization rather than democracy is a question or there's a real challenge of a slight to authoritarianism. It's the government itself in many respects that represents the deepest threat to free speech and that really reverses or alters our perspective perhaps on the opening remarks that we had from Cass, not, I mean, in a democratic setting, his framework just operates very differently than in some of the other settings that we may be discussing. And specifically drawing on Karen's insights, I mean, it's worth noting, how do we get from democracy to either authoritarianism or a turn towards authoritarianism? Uh, there turns out to be a much finer line between democratic processes and authoritarianism than we had once appreciated. And the politics of polarization in a context in which you have the kind of demographic distribution that Karen was describing can be especially effective. So if you only get 50% or so of the population to the polls, uh, and you have a third of the population that has these kinds of predispositions, you can take a politics of um, a plur plurality of the constituency supporting particular kinds of approaches and consolidate that into a form of majoritarianism because you're only getting, in any case, a kind of plurality of the population at best supporting any particular policy. So if you understand this, if you appreciate this as someone who is seeking to consolidate authoritarian control, it becomes relatively simple to then weaponize fear and to truck in forms of disinformation and falsehood that enable you to make claims, allegedly majoritarian claims, about the democratic quality of your electoral strategy, which is in fact designed to achieve authoritarian ends. And here I think information plays an incredibly important role. Um, and there are a number of things I just wanna highlight from the Turkish context that can be generalized, I think, to many others, including as we just heard from uh, David Law, but I think equally in the Indian case. The first is the significance of the consolidation of media control. So the ways in which the government can use its own powers, first of all, to sideline or silence opposition or dissident speech, but also um, pro-government actors may find it in their um, you know, private sector interest to gain control over media in ways that serve government agendas, but also uh, further their own you know, private self-interest. Uh, so they become incentivized uh, to purchase, make media acquisitions as conglomerates as part of an expression of their support for an authoritarian government strategies. And over time, what you find is a combination of a kind of public private um, partnership, if you want, that is especially destructive of both the space for public debate in any meaningful um, capacity in the traditional media, and also a very potent weapon for propagating disinformation um, and for presenting falsehood, increasingly not only as an official narrative, but as the only narrative that's in town, and one that then, of course, doubles down on the kinds of biases that Cass described. Um, and you know, I don't need to say Turkey has become the largest jailer of journalists in the world, um, that we have open government sponsorship of disinformation, that uh, Turkey is often in the uh, first ranked in lists produced by Reuters and others of the degree to which the public believes it is systematically exposed to fake news. But the core message here is that in a universe of media consol consolidation of media control, the media amplify the government's strategies dramatically, the traditional media, in ways that enable further of polarization and present critics as internal threats, as um, dangerous, as criminal, as terroristic, and that these are especially potent uh, strategies in the in the universe of disinformation in a circumstance of authoritarian consolidation. Uh, the second point I would make that draws again on the Turkish case is uh, social media regulation. 
and the ways in which, again, this operates hand in hand in a way as a public private partnership. So on the one hand, you have strategies like the ones that you've seen in the Turkish case, most recently content removal, data localization laws that insist that user data be stored within the country so the government can use the presence of social media platforms as a means of expanding government surveillance of citizens and imposing fines, you know, bans, limitations on bandwidth and so forth. Uh, where any company, international company, might seek to uh, resist compliance. So what you then see is compliance by social media companies in the Turkish case, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and others have all entered into partnerships effectively with the government, uh, which demonstrates a different kind of risk associated with leaving free speech protections in the hands of profit-seeking international companies that may be more interested in markets than in the marketplace of ideas in the ways that we heard from Cass. It's not so much the worry about whether they will engage in forms of regulation, but rather the degree to which they will comply with authoritarian speech repression when the government purports to act to regulate and social media companies act in partnership with the government. The last point I wanna make, uh, which is one that hasn't come up as much, is the throttling of academic freedom as part of the kind of post-truth authoritarian politics um, that have occurred in Turkey and in much of the world. Uh, so to the extent that the government is engaging in these strategies, it's because it prizes control over information and the means of producing information. And so knowledge production comes to represent a certain kind of risk in a world in which disinformation, falsehood, fake news uh, serve the interests of government. And so the criminalization of alternative knowledge production and thereby the criminalization of academics that are engaged in research. So for example, in the Turkish context, academics working on everything from the environment to public health in the context of the pandemic, to urban planning policies, not just uh, academics working on authoritarianism or democracy or questions that are more obviously uh, associated with the topics that we're discussing, but those producing forms of knowledge that just call into question the competence of government, the, the uh, validity of the claims that are being made by the government in support of its policies come to be criminalized. And, and it really means that work in the domain of social science itself comes to be framed as a national security threat precisely because national security depends upon in the framing of the government the maintenance of um, the narrative that they're propagating with the willful collaboration of both traditional and social media platforms so i'll just stop there extremely interesting and sobering David Law, you wanted to jump in on that. And of course, I think one of the things that's worth highlighting is that India and Turkey have a lot of parallels here and that the academic freedom part of things is an especially troubling and notable part of recent developments uh, in India, to which I was alluding in mentioning Pratap. David, on media concentration or anything else um, that Azla would highlight it? I, I really want to uh, echo and, and amplify something that Azla was saying. You'll never actually wipe out fake news maybe not even in democracies, but definitely not in hybrid transitional non-democratic settings, you will just be left with the fake news that the government wants, spewing forth from state media, propaganda outlets, private proxies for the state. And this will all be done in the name of national security, but national security will never be national security. It's always regime security. It's all it is. A Reynoldsian caution. So I want to now turn to a second kind of theme around COVID and democracy before we, we come back to constitutions and design and what can we do at the level of public law to respond to what are very troubling uh, challenges. So, you know, India has obviously had an absolutely, you know, horrible recent uh, surge in COVID-19 cases. Other parts of the world have uh, faced very severe challenges, including many of our colleagues joining uh, from Latin America. Of course, last year, the United States was right in that, although it's now doing better. Karen, you've talked about what sort of COVID and threats like that mean for democracy in the following terms. You said the biggest question is whether the pandemic is ultimately perceived as a collective or as a personal threat. Can you explain to us more what you meant and how that fits with your earlier analysis about authoritarian predispositions? So if you think of authoritarian predisposition, as I've described it, as a person who has a really unusual investment in a particular us and in um, instituting uh, policies that um, glorify, privilege and reward us 
and diminish, demean and discriminate against them. And the them is all the difference, right? It's political deviance, it's moral deviance, it's political dissenters, it's racial and ethnic uh, diverse groups. All of those things are sources of difference. Um, so there's sort of the idea of the one true people, the one right way to be. And then the government is just a form, you know, a state authority that you want to use in pursuit of um, basically elevating your own group and diminishing the other. And so it's a very, so the point I'm trying to make is a very collective orientation. It's not an individual thing at all. They're very heavily invested in us and the us can change, but I'll come back to that later. And so what I found long before COVID existed, and it was a really, really consistent finding. And I had the hardest time in the beginning getting people to take it seriously, but I, I could see that it was really theoretically and, and empirically important is that collective threats aggravate authoritarians and increase the expression of racism and intolerance. If they think there's a threat to um, you know, leaders that they respect and admire, uh, values that they think are the things that made us great, um, if they think there's a collective threat, it activates their predispositions and you see increased expression of intolerance and racism. But a personal threats, on the other hand, actually diminish their expression of racism and intolerance. And everyone's going, well, why on earth would that be? So you can see that fears about uh, crime trends in the aggregate aggravate authoritarians, but their own personal experience of crime actually diminishes their expression of intolerance. Uh, same with personal financial stress, uh, same with sort of health problems, their own individual health problems. So every anything that's sort of individually and so the way I always thought of that is um, these are things that distract authoritarians from their problematic concern with the fate of the collective, thereby improving their behavior. And it's been a very consistent finding is that if you mess them up individually, and obviously I'm not promoting that as a solution, but if things are going bad for them in their personal life, it distracts them from their very problematic concern with the collective because all the negatives, the externalities that we all sort of suffer for, on account of their predispositions are from them sort of being afraid about what's happening to the collective. And so I thought COVID was something that it was really critical how that was going to be framed as something that's individually threatening or threatening the collective. And one of the things that was really sort of um, disturbing to me is that Donald Trump got in really, really early and effectively framed it as a collective hoax. It's these people are trying to hurt us. The Democrats and others are trying to hurt us. This is a fake thing, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They're trying to undermine our great progress and they're trying to hurt you. And so he framed it as a collective threat very early on. So I was very concerned that the uh, Democrats needed to take that back from him because there was no longer any sort of capacity for that to become an individual sort of uh, concern. And so I think one of the things that's actually happened, and I sort of, I wrote about this sort of middle of last year, and I'm pleased to see that it's happening, is that Biden's really effectively created an alternative us. And so, you know, I'm describing how, um, and we haven't talked about normative threat yet, but normative threat is like loss of confidence in leaders and institutions and loss of a sense that we have consensual values that, you know, keep us together and that made us great. So those are the classic normative threats that activate authoritarianism and increase their expression of intolerance and racism. Um, but, you know, like when I say these are people who are heavily invested in the idea of us, it's actually remarkably malleable. What the, uh, what the boundaries of us are. And that's why I always tell people, sort of people get really sort of demoralized and say, we've got these vast waves of racism and we're never gonna climb out of this sort of racist. I think, and I always point out that a lot of that is driven but not by racism per se, but by differencism. The same people who want to reduce um, illegal immigrants and legal immigration also, uh, also want to discriminate against African-Americans, also want to sort of have state authority messing with people's moral choices, also want to diminish, uh, you know, the free expression and free press. So all of those things tend to go together. It's a, it's a differencism, not a racism. And if you can provide an alternative us that's providing more calm reassurance and more normative order than the, the other guy, then that actually people a considerable portion of those authoritarians can change their allegiance. So I'm hopeful at this point and hoping that I'm not going to turn out to be wrong, that Biden so far is effectively creating an alternative, more comforting and reassuring us to the constant panic that's being promoted by Trump and, and those guys. So the point I'm trying to emphasize is it's not set in stone. They have a very strong us-iness, a very strong groupiness, but it's not necessarily invested in this particular, it's not forever and eternally invested in this particular group. And so I'm always encouraging people not to try and change who authority, 
what authoritarians need because you can't, you're changing how they meet their needs. You find other ways to meet their needs for oneness and sameness that don't create negative consequences for everybody else. It's interesting. It's about trying to appeal to people's collective sensibility in fighting COVID rather than some external threat. But it is, I mean, if you think in terms of um, the nature of an epidemic where other people's behaviour do has a big impact on, on our lives, it's hard to sort of think about that lesson about personal threat because, you know, I, I'm always struck when you wear a mask, you are protecting others as much as yourself and that sort of collective personal is so intertwined. Yeah. I want to come back to you in just a minute, Karen, to provide a provocation about liberalism and constitutionalism as we often see it in the kind of way that uh, David embraced and then have our panellists react before we're out of time. But Indira, did you want to just take one minute to say something about COVID and Modi and in India? Because obviously it has been so distressing to read and learn about and it seems to be a big uh, part of the current challenge for democracy, good government and human rights in India. You need to unmute, sorry, Indira. Okay. Uh, just a minute or maybe less than that, because it flows from what I said earlier. Um, I mean, basically, uh, again, it was the breakdown of the rule of law, which led to the centralization of decision making, which meant that those who were in charge of dealing with the epidemic were unwilling to consult experts, whether they were epidemiologists or immunologists or public health experts, or economists, and reliance was placed on politicians and bureaucrats within the inner circle of the prime minister's office. And we believe that this is what led to the what is popularly known as the second wave. So again, it was a complete denial of participation by civil society, which led to this, and reliance on laws which enable them to do this, such as the Disaster Management Act. So I would say it goes back to the same issue of how much do you respect civil society? How much are you willing to take their inputs into consideration? Thank you. So Karen, in some of your work, you said we need to rethink liberalism and how we think about norms, about pluralism in order to deactivate uh, people's sense of normative threat and therefore the authoritarian mindset. Can you tell us what that would mean in terms of norms of non-discrimination, religious accommodation, uh, open borders versus restrictive immigration policies? Give us a couple of examples and let's hear Asla and David Indira respond. Is this the kind of change we could live with in order to shore up democracy and protect against the authoritarian dynamic? I don't think it requires unpacking all those critical protections for minority rights. And as long as those things are being consensually supported by uh, you know, unified elites and they're not being constantly undermined, that that's actually really important because you can imagine people who want strong leadership and good institutions and obedience and conformity are in favor of institutions if they're producing the feeling that they need to get from it. So I don't think it, it's as dire as it sounds on its surface. But you know, the truth is that liberal democracy has exceeded many people's capacity to tolerate it, right? And we can do all the moralizing we want about how we want our ideal democratic citizens to be. But as I've said many times, democracy is most secure and tolerance is maximized when we design institutions to, to, to accommodate how people actually are. And a very large chunk of the population is already struggling with liberal democracy. And that's only going to become more diverse and complex and more difficult for them to manage. And sort of when I talk about differencism, you can see that there's racial, you know, there's tolerance of racial difference, tolerance of moral difference, tolerance of political difference. You know, authoritarians have a limited budget for tolerating difference. And if you make them tolerate a lot of racial and ethnic diversity, they, they've got less left for, you know, it really is simply like this. Uh, you're not going to educate them to love democracy. The more you throw it in their face, the more they're driven not to their, um, you know, optimal tolerance, but to their intolerant extremes, the more you try and get them to love this thing that the rest of us love. And so the only thing you can do is create the what I call the feeling, and it always sounds manipulative, 
manipulative when I say it, to create the feeling or appearance of oneness and sameness. And that can actually be achieved in lots of um, sort of interesting ways that mostly just have to do with the way in which people are experiencing their uh, their society and, and, and their polity. And, you know, things are, I, I work with organizations in the UK uh, more in common um, uh, with things like, you know, the great get together and, you know, People have things called the big day out where you bring people together from different race and ethnic groups and, and try and make people have you know pack picnics and dinner parties and whatever with people they wouldn't normally mix with. And that sounds sort of very low key, but those things turn out to be really important. I think just allowing people to have the discussion about immigration, where are they coming from? How fast are they coming in? How are we gonna like integrate them into our society? Just allowing people to actually say those things and talk out loud allows us to process those things in mainstream political processes without any harm. Um, and, and anything less than that sort of pushes them underground and out to the extremes. And I don't think that that's healthy. And so then you can have, you know, how, how many and from where and what do we need to do to support them are empirical questions. Uh, the answers are known, but we don't know them because we're not allowed to talk about them or study them. And there's clearly some rate that that works for a society with different qualities and depending upon uh, the, you know, the, the similarity between the cultures people are coming from and going to. And it just requires a lot more resources that are put behind that, including a lot more resources uh, with native language acquisition and integration into the community. Excuse me. So um, that suggests you're running. Yeah, you might time. you might end up having you know an, a, another word, but in a context of if you like controlled but you know really um, mindful integration of immigration, it doesn't sound so um, challenging to liberalism. But take mm. it to Turkey as a you know one could reinterpret Karen's argument as one that embraces a much stronger role for demonstrable displays of religion in the public square, um, a kind of vision of the state that is more religiously inflected and less liberal. Would that be a price worth paying for democracy to be shored up and the authoritarian mindset to be downplayed? I mean, I I'll ask Indira the same, is a degree of Hinduization a price worth paying for uh, a stronger democracy? I'm not suggesting that that is what Karen is advocating. I'm putting it on the table as the provocation that her ideas raise to hear your thoughts, um, Asla. Sure. Um, so Turkey had a longstanding constitutional order committed to a form of very aggressive secularism, which itself was anti-pluralist. So what's I think important to understand about that is that it wasn't a liberal project. It was a top-down, um, you know, sort of cultural revolutionary project of a different time at the beginning of the 20th century uh, at, at a time when social engineering projects of this kind were deemed tolerable and so forth. So in a way, the rise of the current ruling party in Turkey was a mechanism for pluralizing the political spectrum in its own sense uh, and breaking the kind of stranglehold that a particular ideological lock had on our constitutional imagination in the country. And I do think that pluralization was necessary. And there are two core cleavages of the founding of the Turkish constitutional order. One was around the status of this uh, relationship between state and religion, so secularism. And the other one was around the ethnic conception of citizenship. So a national identity forged on Turkishness to the exclusion, for example, of the largest ethnic minority in the country, the Kurdish community. And this idea, this homogenizing project of nation building is one that's actually common to much of the region, the whole of the Middle East. And indeed, I would argue much of the post-colonial world uh, embraced a concept of nation uh, you know, bequeathed to us from various kinds of Western uh, and European political thought that emphasized homogenization in particular ways. And I think to, quite to the contrary of the implication of the question, uh, which is that, um, you know, having tolerating a degree of, uh, you know, greater religious expression, for example, in the constitutional order in Turkey would represent a sacrifice of liberalism. I would actually argue that that would be an endorsement of liberalism. It's an endorsement of the pluralization of our conception of citizenship and meaningful political participation. But the uh, ruling party in Turkey, the government in Turkey at the moment is not a vehicle for pluralization at all, although it presented itself that way at the outset. Instead, it is seeking to impose its own homogenizing vision. It is governing 
winning by a strategy of polarization, as I've already mentioned, that very much trucks in the us and them logic that Karen has been describing uh, and, you know, presents a, a supposedly authentic nation or uh, national identity and then presents all critics and opponents as part of a threatening other that is in some way calling into question this authentic nation that the government purports to represent. Those strategies are extraordinarily dangerous and extraordinarily powerful, obviously. And I think the response to them is not counter polarization, that is to embrace uh, you know, our liberal selves as an other and demonize the constituencies that support the government at present, but rather anti-polarization. Uh, in other words, seeking to transcend a logic of us and them in particular ways that involve building a kind of cross-cutting um, broad coalitional politics. And this is less about constitutional design, although I do think constitutional design is significant and the government's strategy of detaching democracy from liberal commitments has been very, very damaging and requires a kind of constitutional renewal in Turkey, if you want, that is a much broader subject than the one that we're engaging in at the moment in this, in this conversation. But what we have seen in Turkey is the success of uh, not worrying whether commitments to cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism represent a pitfall, let's say, for liberal democratic uh, constitutional responses to authoritarian populism, but rather um, constructively asking what it might take to build large cross-cutting coalitions that span the spectrum of race, ethnicity, religion, and class in ways that put into practice an electoral strategy based on pluralist commitments. So in Turkey, what this has meant is a politics, again, transcending the us and them strategy by running on a different kind of message of unity that identifies popular policies to tackle, for example, urban poverty that have cross-cutting support and embracing a kind of big tent approach with a campaign around inclusive, hopeful, and positive accounts of shared political community. So for example, in 2019, there was a, a local election in which the opposition routed the ruling party in all the major urban centers in the country. And famously, one of the core opposition politicians ran on a platform that literally was everything is going to be fine, everything is going to be great, uh, as a hopeful message, basically, to say we can unify around a positive vision of what a future might look like for our nation against this kind of politics of fear. And I think, again, this, this connects directly to Karen's comments. So an inclusive redefinition of an us that encompasses religiously uh, conservative or practicing religious individuals that in, that ha imagines the public space as one that is capable of tolerating broad religious expression as well as secular practices and politics and one that is uh, capacious enough to have a conception of citizenship that is civic rather than ethnic. These kinds of strategies to my mind, anti-polarization strategies combined with forms of constitutional design we can talk about in a different con conversation that would replace our current repressive constitutional order in Turkey with something more emancipatory, uh, I think would be the strategies to my mind that are that marry Karen's insights with a commitment to liberal democracy and cosmopolitanism, rather than suggesting that they're intention. Well, the I'm inclusive us, I mean, I'll come back to you, Karen, the, the inclusive, the inclusive us is an appealing uh, vision of how to rethink Turkish politics. There's a great question in the chat that I'm going to bring to you as a sort of closing comment from you, uh, David, about if you like protest in Hong Kong and these issues around liberalism and, and normative threat. Um, if anyone has the chance who's on the panel to look at the questions and answers and wants to type any responses while we are in our final minutes, I really invite you to do that. Indira, is it, is it worth making changes to our understanding of Indian uh, sort of neutrality and embracing some aspects of uh, what the BGP has called for in order to save democracy, or is it a fool's errand and we need to reimagine an inclusive us without making any sacrifices in the, the founding vision? Yeah, not surprisingly, uh, I agree with almost all the comments of the previous speaker from Turkey, uh, but there are differences in our history of the two countries. Uh, the point is that when we gave ourselves a constitution almost 75 years ago, we uh, had a slightly different vision of secularism. It was not the kind of aggressive secularism that she talked about. What our courts have said is secularism in India means equal respect for all religions. And, uh, and therefore we thought that this was a very pluralistic definition, which would embrace within itself um, all religious communities which would have equal status in the country. 
The problem in our country is that with the advent of the BJP in 2014, there was a sharp break to that understanding of secularism. In that sense, our histories are different. Our strategies may be the same, but our, and, and you know, for me, having lived through the era prior to 2014, I can see the difference very starkly. And I'm not saying that we were living in a perfect world before 2014, we weren't, but we did not face this kind of attack where we see lynching of minorities in India today. And it's now state policy. Somebody talked about in-migration. In India, we are talking about out-migration. And you can hear officially governments saying, well, if you're Muslim, if you don't like India, go to Pakistan, right? How does one tolerate something like this? It brings up the whole question of who is a citizen? Is it, am I a citizen because I'm a Hindu or am I a citizen because I'm a civic citizen? So in that sense, there is no escape from returning back to our roots, from returning back to our understanding of pluralism, returning back to our understanding of what we mean when we say we respect all religions, because right now we are going through a period where our governments are saying there is one religion and we are all, they see religion as culture. They say culturally, you may, be, you may be a Muslim religiously, but culturally you're a Hindu. So this really weird definition of what is culture, I, I'm sorry, I can't accept that as an inclusive definition of us. We, we need to accept that we are different. Well, I think the challenge from Karen is some people can't, and the question is how do we respond to that? And I think Indira has given us a very compelling account that cultural Hinduization is probably the wrong sacrifice to make uh, when we're talking about what can be renegotiated in uh, a liberal democratic vision as it works in India. So we've got some really interesting questions emerging in the chat and the Q&A. It's a, it's a two-part uh, written discussion about intermediaries, what role can sort of public participation play, unions, Mark Graeber said. Uh, we've also got really interesting questions about, um, you know, specific cases uh, and examples. David, did you want to say anything general or specific about, if you like, the protest movements and the sense that, uh, you know, the normative threat in Hong Kong of recent times has been protest and democratization and the ways in which a medium term democratization project has to accommodate a sense of normative threat or has to hold true to your liberal starting point or avoid that question and speak more generally if that seems appropriate. Uh, I, I may speak, I think I'll start more general and maybe it will tie back to the, to the point. I, I think, uh, um, if we haven't already buried the concept of the end of history, it's something we're going to have to get used to, and particularly it's the case in Asia. If I had to summarize the political situation in East Asia and Southeast Asia, I, two words, um, pluralism or heterogeneity and inertia. And those cut both ways. You know, on the inertia, on the, on the pluralism front, this is a region where totalitarian regimes exist next door to liberal democracies. And it's been that way for decades. And so we are going to have to learn to coexist. And as comparative Kwan law scholars, we're going to have to learn to navigate and make sense of deal with a world in which these regimes, you know, authoritarians are not going to wish away liberal democracies, but we're also seeing liberal democracies are not going to wish away authoritarians. And in this sense, you know, you could, we don't experience this so much in North America. It's not like, you know, Americans don't worry about Canada or Mexico, you know, in Europe. I mean, yeah, you know, Hungary and Poland, but it's nothing compared to South Korea having North Korea for a neighbor or Taiwan having mainland China for a neighbor. You know, this is a total different ballpark. And so we're just going to have to get used to the fact that neither of these sides is going away anytime soon. And in fact, you know, it's been stable since the Big Bang of the late, late 1980s when a bunch of these countries democratized. Uh, not much has changed, really. No real revolution. Like Saharda went down in the end of the 90s. That's about it, right? So we got to live, and it's not an exception. Asia is not some outlier. It's just a, a, a study in dramatic contrasts, right? You know, Australia to Papua New Guinea, those are very different worlds. Um, and, uh, you know, it's over half the world's population. So this is the rule, not the exception, globally speaking. 
regime heterogeneity, having to live with totally incompatible regimes next door to you. You know, the other is um, inertia. Um, again, you know, there are hopes that, you know, it used to be, we, we hope that China would democratize. Now China's banging the shoe on the table saying they're gonna bury liberal democracy. That's not happening either, right? You have these regimes that are stable and they've stayed stable for decades. And frankly, you know, the people will say, well, what about, you know, Myanmar? What about, in, you know, uh, Thailand? What about this regime or Cambodia? Those regimes never stabilized in the first place. So the regimes that are stable are stable. The regimes that were never stable are remaining unstable. Uh, and there's not a lot, a whole lot of change on the horizon. You know, so Asia is going to remain ideologically, politically, constitutionally very diverse. And we have to live with that. And one thing I'd like to see the field do is to really engage in a serious way with the constitutionalism and the practices of non-liberal and or non-democratic regimes, because they are not going away. We need to engage. We're not going to evangelize them successfully. They're not going to evangelize us successfully. So what are we going to do about it? Well, thank you so much, David. We're out of time, but there's just a, a steady flow of really fascinating comments and questions in the chat. Uh, and, and, you know, praise. I want to just note, Kim Lanchette has said, uh, you know, as panellists, you have shown how crucial it is to link a global perspective in public law to political psychology. Absolutely fabulous. So in Kim's words and many others, thank you to our panellists. This has been a really interesting and substantive discussion, which is often pretty hard on a panel uh, on Zoom, let alone uh, first thing in the morning where Asla is and very late at night where Karen is and everywhere in between. So please join me in virtually uh, pressing your reaction button if you can find it to, to thank them. And if not, uh, accept my very sincere thanks uh, on behalf of the society to all four of our panelists for a really terrific uh, discussion. This is uh, going to be available on YouTube and I'm sure that the con uh, conversation that's been you know, generated tonight will continue. And there are lots of important questions that are raised, but we're very grateful uh, to all for such distinguished and insightful panelists for their contribution today. Thank you very much. Thank you also, Rob.